Hi, and welcome to our second video on the immune system. Today, we're going to be talking about immune cells. So we'll be talking about the cells that make up both your innate and your adaptive immune system. We'll talk about where they're produced. We'll talk about where they function and how they function to help keep you alive by fighting off invading pathogens. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. As I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about the cells of your immune system. So another word for the cells of our immune system are white blood cells. And like all white blood cells and red blood cells, they're going to be born in the bone marrow through a process called hematopoiesis. Now, hematopoiesis starts with a self-renewing stem cell that can then go on to divide and differentiate into what's called a bipotential cell. That bipotential cell will then either give rise to a cell that is part of the innate immune system or a cell that is part of the adaptive immune system. Cells that are part of the innate immune system or red blood cells as well are produced through this process are produced in the bone marrow and then they leave the bone marrow and enter the bloodstream and begin circulating throughout the body. Sometimes they'll hang out in the, in the blood, blood vessels like neutrophils and other times they'll end up in the tissues like macrophages and dendritic cells. On the other hand, the cells of the adaptive immune system branch, those cells are going to have to do some further maturation. So if it's going to be a part of the B cell lineage, those cells are going to go to the bone marrow. They'll stay in the bone marrow, go to a different spot in the bone marrow, and they're going to undergo a maturation process in which they will receive their specialized B cell receptor. T cells, on the other hand, will enter circulation briefly to go to the thymus. In the thymus there, they will end up getting their specialized T cell receptor and undergoing their maturation process. We'll talk at length about what that maturation process looks like. The one cell that's part of the adaptive immune system branch that doesn't do this process is called a natural killer cell. A natural killer cell is essentially a receptorless T cell. It enters circulation as an innate immune cell. So even though it is part of the adaptive immune branch of hematopoiesis, it is technically classified as innate as an innate immune cell because of its functionality. So when we talk about the different types of cells that are part of the immune system, there are lots of ways that we discuss them. So for example, we can discuss what part of the immune system they reside in. So for example, we've already talked about them as either innate immune cells or adaptive immune cells. We can also talk about them based on their functionality. So are they a phagocyte or are they a non-phagocyte? So are they a cell that eats other cells or are they not a cell that eats other cells? The other thing we can often talk about is their appearance. So it's very common, for example, in an anatomy and physiology class to lump white blood cells into either granulocytes or agranulocytes. We're going to kind of function at all levels in this particular video, and we'll try to mention all of these different characteristics in terms of are they a phagocyte, are they an innate immune cell, and would they be considered a granulocyte? So just understand that there are different ways of classifying cells depending on how you're examining them and what you care about in terms of how you're studying them. Do you care about their activity? Do you care about how they go about being part of the innate immune system? Or do you care about what they look like under a microscope? So let's start with cells that make up our innate immune system. So the big thing about the innate immune system is remember that the innate immune system does not neither confer specificity nor memory. Essentially, the job of the cells that are part of the innate immune system is to recognize through specialized receptors whether something is self or part of the body and whether it is foreign and not a part of the body. For the most part, their response is, if you're not self, then you probably need to leave. Now, one group of innate immune cells fall under the category of phagocytes. These are cells that specialize in doing something called phagocytosis. Um, there are three major cell types that we'll talk about. They are considered phagocytes, and they go about their jobs in different ways. The first one we'll talk about is the macrophage. Now, the macrophage actually gives rise to a, it gives rise from a circulating cell called a monocyte. And a monocyte is a cell that's part of the innate immune system. It circulates in the blood vessels. And then when it reaches the tissue, that monocyte must differentiate either into a macrophage or a dendritic cell. So if you hear somebody talking about a monocyte, they're referring to a circulating cell that once it gets to the tissue will actually become either a macrophage or a dendritic cell. Either way, a monocyte is going to give rise to a phagocyte. So the macrophage gets its name, it literally translates to big eater, because that's what a macrophage does. So a macrophage is one of your body's sentinel cells. It hangs out in the tissues, typically just adjacent to blood vessels, and it basically monitors parts of your body where invasions are likely to occur. Now, as its day-to-day -day job, the macrophage kind of wanders through your tissue and collects cellular debris, so it gets rid of uh, dead and dying cells that maybe have undergone apoptosis or have died because of old age. And, and, or, or any other debris that kind of collects in that tissue, it eats it, breaks it down, and then uh, exocytosis is the waste product. However, 
The macrophage, as well as numerous other innate immune cells, are covered in receptors called pathogen recognition receptors, or PRRs. And these specialized receptors uh, interact with broad classes of molecules that help to recognize cells that aren't supposed to be there. So they can recognize, for example, something like lipopolysaccharide on the outside of a gram-negative bacterium, or they can recognize uh, different other components that our body doesn't produce. Now, if one of these pathogen recognition receptors interacts with something called a pathogen-associated molecular pattern, or a PAMP, which could be something like lipopolysaccharide or some other foreign material, that can actually activate it, and at that point, it will actually begin to follow that particular breadcrumb trail of, of PAMPs to try to figure out what's causing the problem. If a macrophage encounters something of a foreign nature that doesn't belong in the body, it will then, quite simply, phagocytose it. It will eat it. Now, macrophages, as we'll learn when we talk more in detail about the innate immune system, can actually undergo several phases of being activated and hyperactivated, and this dictates how much it's going to eat in its other activities. Another thing a macrophage can do is secrete small communication proteins called cytokines. These cytokines are actually very important because they can trigger the inflammatory response in a tissue where an invasion is occurring. This inflammatory response can trigger the response of other immune cells. It can also make the blood vessels become dilated and allow cells to enter from the blood into the tissue from the bloodstream. This is sort of the first step in getting other cells as well as other blood components uh, such as antibodies and complement and other things into the tissue to help fight off the infection. So a macrophage is considered a phagocyte, and it is probably the most predominant phagocyte because it can eat up to, up to several dozen or 100 cells, depending on hyper, how hyperactivated it actually is. Another cell that resides in the tissue, its monocyte cousin, the dendritic cell, is also considered to be a phagocyte. But what a dendritic cell is, is slightly different. Yes, like a macrophage, a dendritic cell is going to be coded in pathogen recognition receptors. It is going to respond to the presence of foreign material in the form of PAMPs. It can also secrete cytokines that can trigger inflammation. But the big thing is this, a dendritic cell is a phagocyte, but it is not going to go around eating whole other cells like a macrophage will. Instead, what the dendritic cell is interested in doing, it's interested in collecting what we refer to as battlefield antigen. It doesn't want to eat the whole cells, but what it wants to do is sort of gather up the cellular debris that is evidence of the battle. You can almost think of the dendritic cell as a photojournalist. Its job isn't to get involved in the fight. That's what macrophage is, and as we'll learn, neutrophils are going to do. But what the dendritic cell's job is, is to collect as much of that battlefield antigen as it possibly can ingest it through phagocytosis, and then what it's going to do is it's going to hop into the nearest lymph vessel and travel to the nearest secondary lymphoid organ, which is typically what's considered, which, which is typically going to be a lymph node. And there, it will use that battlefield antigen to activate the third line of defense or your adaptive immune system. So we'll talk a little bit more about the lymphatic system in a little bit, as well as those T and B cells that will need to be activated by the activity of the dendritic cell. The third phagocyte doesn't actually reside in the tissue to begin with. It actually is the neutrophil. So neutrophils reside in the bloodstream. Neutrophils are actually kind of dangerous. So you can think of them as sort of the foot soldiers of your immune system. There are about 20 billion strong in circulation. They're very short lived. So unlike macrophages and dendritic cells, which can live, live for weeks, uh, a neutrophil typically lives about five days. So right now in your bloodstream, you have about 20 billion neutrophils and five days from now, you'll have 20 billion new ones because those other ones will have died. So the neutrophil, uh, the neutrophils are all around in the bloodstream, and the reason why we kind of keep them there is they're one of the only cells that can actually damage our own tissues. And that's because neutrophils are actually granulocytes. So macrophages and dendritic cells are not considered to be granulocytes, whereas neutrophils are. And granulocytes are cells like neutrophils, mast cells, basophils. They have these granules that are packed full of things like inflammatory cytokines and antimicrobial compounds that can actually physically destroy and damage microbes that are causing harm in our body. The downside is some of those chemicals can actually be harmful to our tissues. So having neutrophils in our tissues at all times can be problematic because it can lead to uh, chronic inflammation and it can lead, uh, lead to the buildup of cellular damage. So we keep them in the bloodstream and then we only, uh, we only call for them when we actually need them. So as I mentioned before, dendritic cells and macrophages have the ability to produce cytokines that can trigger the inflammatory response. Part of this inflammatory response allows the blood vessels to dilate, and this allows neutrophils, as well as in a moment we'll talk about natural killer cells, to enter into the tissue through a process called diapodesis. So essentially, they're on-call killers that come when our body is recognized that there's a problem inside of the tissue. During this point in time, the neutrophils will come in. Uh, they, will, they are phagocytes, so they can kill uh, foreign, foreign 
invaders in a number of different ways. One way is to eat them through phagocytosis. Uh, another way is to release their payload of cytotoxic uh, compounds that can act to destroy microbes. Um, and the, uh, the third way to do it is actually producing something called a, uh, called a net, which is a, a, a basically they secrete a bunch of stuff outside their cell that can entangle uh, invaders. So neutrophils are probably uh, our best killing weapon that we have as part of our innate immune system. Macrophages are great at eating things and they're kind of a jack of all trades in terms of the fact that they can signal. We'll talk about that they're also able to do antigen presentation. Um, dendritic cells are professional antigen presenting cells, which is why they're able to activate the adaptive immune system. We'll talk about what that means uh, in a later video. Uh, but neutrophils really don't bother with any of the other nonsense. They're going to secrete their payload of cytokines that trigger further inflammation. They're going to secrete their cytotoxic compounds and destroy invaders. And they're going to eat a few things and they're basically going to die. They are the predominant cell involved in the initial stages of any infection. And if you've ever seen pus, pus is essentially a pile of millions of dead neutrophils that have done their job. They're very short lived and they're sort of uh, they sort of come into our tissues uh, when they're needed do what they need to do, die, and they help to stave off the early infection. Another cell that is part of our innate immune system are natural killer cells. Now, natural killer cells, if you recall from our previous conversation about hematopoiesis, are actually born as part of the adaptive immune cell branch of our white blood vessel, our white blood cells. However, they don't go through that maturation process, and because they don't get their specialized T cell receptor, which the rest of its T cell cousins do get, um, it's an innate immune cell. The uh, natural killer cells are typically hanging around in the bloodstream, but they also may hide out in the bone marrow or in the spleen, and they respond on call. Like neutrophils, natural killer cells can be on the scene of an infection within about 30 minutes of being activated uh, by the infl inflammatory process initiated by dendritic cells and macrophages. So they will come into the tissue. Now, natural killer cells are sort of our innate immune system's specialized weapon for fighting off virally infected cells. Macrophages and dendritic cells and neutrophils, for the most part, will leave our own cells alone because remember they're self but what if one of your self cells is uh, is uh, infected with a virus well macrophages aren't really going to help and neutrophils may kill some by accident on the other hand a natural killer cell can actually help to remove virally infected cells how does this do this well the natural killer cell actually has specialized receptors on its surface and what it looks for it looks to find cells that have uh, markers on their surface so receptors they're actually called uh, MHCs or major histocompatibility complexes on the surface of your cells. So by reading the fact that these MHCs exist, that natural killer cell can say, yep, this is one of our own cells. But when cells are infected with a virus, they often produce stress signals to say, hey, something's wrong, please come help. We talked about interferon as a great example of this in our previous video on, on the, the, the lines of defense. So when some of these weird stress proteins or weird carbohydrates are produced and put inside the plasma membrane of one of our cells, it indicates that that cell is somehow in distress. And what natural killer cells can do is they can actually come up and they can look at the balance of healthy MHC signals as well as the I'm in danger, please come help me signals on the surface of one of our cells. And if there are too many of these I'm in danger, I'm infected signals on the surface of that particular cell, the natural killer cell will actually release enzymes that help that cell undergo apoptosis. Natural killer cells are kind of neat. Um, the best way to get rid of one of our virally infected cells is to have it kill itself through the process of apoptosis. This is important because the cell sort of implodes on itself and takes, takes everything down with it, including all the viruses that are inside, and thereby prevents few, uh, further release of those viruses. Uh, this is also very helpful because natural killer cells may also play a role in fighting off cancer cells. So what it turns out is sometimes when our cells are cancerous, they produce some of these stress signals. They may be unable to undergo the process of apoptosis because of the damage that's causing the, the cancerous phenotype. Natural killer cells, on the other hand, can help override that cellular messaging system and basically tell that cell to kill itself because it's a harm to the body as a whole. Natural killer cells are also kind of cool because they can release cytokines that can increase the activity of macrophages as well as other innate immune cells. The last group of innate immune cells that I'll mention here, I'm going to lump together as granulocytes. So as I mentioned before, neutrophils fall into this category as a granulocyte. They have these, if you look at them through the microscope, you'll note that they have these large inclusions inside of the cell. And these granules and neutrophils are packed with not only inflammatory cytokines, but also packed with uh, cytotoxic chemicals that can help to kill off uh, foreign pathogens. 
the three other cell types that sort of fall into this group of granulocytes are mast cells, which are tissue-bound cells, as well as basophils and eosinophils. So basophils and eosinophils are, are in circulation and don't typically reside in the tissues. Now, the major job of these three cells, mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils, is to uh, fight off uh, parasites, things like helminths and fungi and, and, uh, and other associated uh, sort of multicellular pathogens. They can, in some ways, help in other infections. One of the things they're very good at doing is causing inflammation. So those granules are packed with um, cytotoxic chemicals, but are also packed with uh, also packed with cytokines that can recruit other immune cells and also trigger the inflammatory process. Mast cells are particularly of interest to uh, mast cells and basophils are of particular interest to uh, to allergists, and the main reason why is mast cells, for example, as well as the other three, are able to bind to a type of antibody called an IgE antibody. So these cells can be packed, uh, coated with an IgE antibody, and when the, the IgE antibody encounters the antigen it recognizes, it causes those mast cells or basophils to actually degranulate. And this degranulation process releases a burst of inflammatory cytokines that causes a massive response. Now, this is particularly helpful if we're fighting off, for example, a helminth or a fungal infection. What is not helpful is if those IgE antibodies have been made in error against something innocuous. So, for example, like a peanut. So, one of the things that will actually happen is if somebody has developed an allergy to a peanut, they will have mast cells, for example, that are coated with IgE receptors that recognize peanut antigen. And then when somebody bites into a peanut or comes in contact with it, it can cause a massive response like called anaphylaxis. And this is what actually triggers that anaphylactic uh, uh, that anaphylactic shock, um, you know, things like hives and then the, the, the throat swelling and the inability to breathe. It's sort of a, a malfunction in the immune system. We'll talk about that in a subsequent video. So these three granulocytes, mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils, all have the ability to interact with these IgE antibodies. Um, basophils and mast cells are involved in, in, in what we call atopies or anaphylactic allergies. Uh, on the other hand, uh, eosinophils are often... Um, implicated in more chronic allergic conditions like asthma. So eosinophilia is actually a component of, is an overabundance of eosinophils are quite often found in patients that are suffering from asthma and uh, their activities upregulated during an asthma attack. Okay, so that brings us to our adaptive immune cells. So the cells of our adaptive immune system are often referred to as lymphocytes, and these are T and B cells. The reason why they're called lymphocytes is they're typically found most commonly in the secondary lymph organs of our lymphatic system. So our lymphatic system is a sort of a system that parallels our cardiovascular system. You can almost think of our lymphatic system as our cell, as our body's sewer, basically. So what happens over time is fluid will leak out of the cardiovascular system into the tissue, cellular debris, and even pathogens and stuff may be found in our tissue as well. Well, all of that stuff has to go somewhere, and the place that goes is it sort of leaches into this, this series of vessels called the lymphatic system. Now, the lymphatic system is, is all interconnected, and these lymphatic vessels actually um, connect so, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 different lymph nodes and other secondary lymph organs, including our mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, Peyer's patch. Um, inside of our intestines and throughout our body. Now, the cool part about it is this. What that means is anytime something enters into our tissue, whether it's an immune cell or an invader or some other type of cellular debris, it's going to go into the, into the lymphatic system. And there it can actually circulate through the lymphatic system into the, the lymph nodes and other secondary lymphatic organs where it can actually um, interact with most of our immune system, particularly our specialized weapons, the T cells and the B cells. Then what ends up happening is all that fluid that drains in there is actually sort of cleaned up, like what happens at a sanitation plant, and that fluid is then returned to our cardiovascular system. Without a lymphatic system, none of this would be possible, and our, not only would our immunity be hampered, but we begin to swell like a balloon because all of that fluid would remain in our tissues with nowhere else to go. So, where do these T and B cells come from? Well, T and B cells are born in what we call the primary lymphoid organs the bone marrow and the thymus. So as I mentioned before, all blood cells, T and B cells included, are born in the bone marrow. But what has to happen with our T cells and our B cells is they have to undergo a maturation process. And that is because T cells and B cells need to confer specificity upon our immune response. And this is going to require them to develop something called a T cell receptor in the case of T cells and a B cell receptor in the case of B cells. Now, the process of making these is actually quite arduous, but it's very similar between both T cells and B cells. So for B cells, this process of maturation is going to happen in the bone marrow. For T cells, this is going to happen in the thymus. So 
Each B cell will get its own unique, wonderful, awesome, specific B cell receptor, and each T cell will get its own unique, specialized, wonderful T cell receptor. So how does this process happen? Well, the process of doing this is actually uh, so complex and, and was so confounding to uh, early microbiologists that the person who discovered it actually won a Nobel Prize. It's actually known as VDJ recombination. So one of the big questions early on in immunology is how does our body produce B cells and T B cell receptors and T cell receptors that are able to recognize basically anything that can come into our body? Early estimates indicate that you would need about 100 million different possible combinations in order to protect ourselves from pretty much anything that they can encounter in the world. What's interesting is how is this going to happen when we now know the human genome only contains about 25,000 genes? How could this be possible to develop this much diversity? Well, the answer is this process of VDJ recombination. So if we actually look at the, the, what an antibody, which is a secreted B cell receptor or a T cell receptor actually looks like, we'll notice that it's, it's kind of shaped a bit like this. Um, there are several different varieties, but this is the basic shape. The thing to notice is that each, each B cell receptor or T cell receptor is, is, is made up of two immunoglobin heavy chains and two immunoglobin light chains. Now, the heavy chain immunoglobins and the light chain immunoglobins are encoded by two distinct genes. But when we look at these genes and break them down even further, we'll see that these genes are actually broken into different modules. There's a V module and a J module and a D module. There's also a C module. We're not going to talk about that right now. And it turns out within these modules, there are several different uh, versions of these modules that that particular protein can select from in being made. So, for example, there's something like 40 different V segments that are in there. There's, uh, there's like 25 different uh, like J segments and six different Ds. And all that has to happen to form a B cell receptor or a T cell receptor is a single one of these needs to be selected. So you only need one V and one D and one J and one C to make a functional receptor. But what's interesting is while the heavy chain has uh, that many choices of V, D, and J segments, so does the light chain. So what ends up happening is when that receptor is being produced by that newly born B cell or that newly born T cell, it's going to essentially edit its genome. But because this process happens at more or less random, you end up with the potential to form hundreds of millions of different B cell and T cell receptors that recognize a very, very specific antigen, which is called as cognate antigen. Now remember, there's an incredible amount of diversity here for two reasons. One, you have to do this process for both the light chain and the heavy chain, which have an equal amount of diversity encoded within them. Moreover, remember that you have two copies of each. Each person has a maternal copy and a paternal copy of the heavy chain and the light chain, which further increases that diversity. In doing this, your body is able to, from a handful of genes, produce an insane amount of diversity when it comes to the different types of T cell and B cell receptors that they're able to produce. Now, the one thing to note is this. Once a B cell undergoes this process or a T cell undergoes this process of producing a B cell receptor or a T cell receptor, it is stuck. What I mean is that that particular T cell, for example, will always produce that exact same receptor. It may have 100,000 different copies of that specific receptor on its surface, but it's always that identical receptor. And that is going to make it so that T cell only is able to interact with one very specific thing, what we refer to as its cognate antigen. But this is where the specificity comes from. A T cell can only interact with one thing. That's it. Now, the good news is, is you have thousands or millions of T cells throughout your body, all with the ability to actually recognize that one thing that they recognize. So you have an amazing amount of diversity. But the thing you have to understand about your immune system, at least with your T cells and your B cells, is that diversity of receptor ability to bond to things is genetically encoded. They're not made on demand. Your body doesn't go, oh, this thing's invading me. Make me a B cell that can react to it. No. Your body already has to have that B cell present that can react to that thing to cause an immune response. So this gets us to the first aspect of adaptive immune cells. They are specific. Their antibody, or sorry, their B cell receptor or their T cell receptor is able to interact with a very specific thing called its cognate antigen. Actually, the specificity is even greater. It doesn't interact with the entire cognate antigen. It just interacts with a very small portion of it that's called its epitope. So consequently, you could actually have several different B cells or several different T cells that recognize the same pathogen, but they recognize a different portion of it. So if you think of me as a pathogen coming into your body, you might have B cells that can recognize my nose, but other B cells will recognize my fingernails and other ones will recognize my belly button. 
And what ends up happening with that is you can end up with several different B cells that recognize a given pathogen. They just recognize different portions of it. But this diversity in terms of what our body is able to respond to is the essential component of our adaptive immune response. Now, once a B cell or a T cell has undergone this process to generate its own unique, wonderful, awesome T cell receptor or B cell receptor, the next thing that has to happen is a process called immune tolerance. So the thing you have to realize is your immune system has to be tolerant of you. You can't have immune cells running around your body that will recognize self antigen, i.e. things that your body produces, because that would cause your body to mount an immune response against you. Does that happen at times? Yes, it's a process called autoimmunity. And we'll talk a bit more about that in another video on diseases of the immune system. But overall, your body is supposed to prevent this from happening. And there are several fail safes in place to make sure that happens. So the first, so we'll talk about both T cell and B cell immune tolerance. Now it's going to be slightly different um, in terms of what has to happen, depending on whether we're talking about a T cell or a B cell. The location is also different. Again, in T cells, this process is going to occur inside the thymus. If it's a B cell, this process is still happening inside of the bone marrow. So the first thing that has to happen is, is a, uh, what is referred to as a positive selection uh, for T cells and, and, and what we call those major histocompatibility complexes or MHCs. One of the things that has to happen, a T cell needs to be able to interact with a receptor on the surface of other immune cells called an MHC or a major histocompatibility complex because T cells are going to receive their information from other cells in your body. They're going to receive that information because it's going to be contained within those MHCs on the outside of your body's cells. If a T cell is unable to interact with one of your body's MHCs, it's functionally useless and it will be forced to undergo apoptosis and kill itself because it is not able to function properly. So if a cell makes it pass, if a T cell makes it past this first round, of selection, it will then move on to the second round of selection. This round of selection is a negative selection. So the first round of selection then is, can you recognize major histocompatibility complexes so that you can receive information from our body cells? If yes, then you can proceed to step two. The next step is a negative selection because the correct answer to this question is no, I don't. And then no, I don't comes into whether or not a T cell with its specialized T cell receptor will actually begin to interact, will, will, will mount a response against self antigen. So you've got that T cell receptor and that T cell receptor was made through a random process. And that T cell receptor may or may not actually interact with some of the, the antigen produced by your body. So for about two weeks, this T cell is going to sit inside of that thymus and specialized cells from inside of your immune system inside the thymus are going to show that T cell a cross section of every possible antigen that your body can produce. Does it show it everyone? No, but it's a large cross section. And if at any point that T cell receptor reacts strongly to any of that self produced antigen, that T cell will immediately undergo uh, cell suicide, apoptosis and remove itself. It's what's referred to as a forbidden clone because that cell is unable to participate in the immune system in your body because it will react and cause an autoimmunity and it's immediately removed. What's interesting about how arduous this process is, is that with the number of T cells that your body produces, only about one in 30 T cells that enters into this process will actually make it out and enter the immune system as a functional cell. The rest will either fail to react pro appropriately with your MHCs or recognize some type of self antigen, making it a forbidden clone and removing it from the body entirely. Immune tolerance for B cells is achieved basically the same way. Now, this is going to happen in the bone marrow, and we're actually going to skip the first step. Without going into too much detail, B cells are not required to interact with MHCs. That's what T cells do. So they're going to skip that first step of positive selection. But they are going to have to do that other process of making sure that their B cell receptor will not interact with any self antigen. B cells, for the most part, are going to go on to become plasma B cells where they're going to produce antibodies. And the last thing they want is for those antibodies that are produced by that B cell, which are nothing more than a secreted version of their B cell receptor, to interact with any of our own, with any of our own material. Those are called autoantibodies, and they're characteristic of a, new, a number of autoimmunities. So what happens is that B cell will then be shown a cross-section of all the potential self-antigens that our body produces. If it reacts strongly, it won't immediately die. It will actually be allowed to go through a process called receptor editing, where it can try one more time to generate a new B cell receptor that won't interact with self-antigen. If it fails that process a second time, it is then removed from the body. 
overall about one in 10 B cells that begins this process will actually make it through. The, uh, the remaining nine out of 10, 90% will actually have to undergo apoptosis. So what you can see is our body makes a, it makes a lot of different T cells and B cells and only a very, very small group of them actually make it into your body as functional components of your immune system because the remainder of them are essentially forbidden clones. They're not allowed to be there because there's the potential for them to actually cause auto, auto immunities as a result of their ability to recognize self antigen. I will state that this process is not perfect and there are ways that can actually that can bypass this system and we will end up developing things like autoimmunities. We'll talk about that again in a separate video on diseases of the immune system. So once these T cells and B cells are actually produced, they will then, and they've gone through the toler tolerance process and they've matured, they're gonna actually be able to now leave the, the bone marrow and the thymus as mature T cells and B cells. They are what are referred to as naive T cells and B cells at this point. They're considered to be naive because they've never once met their cognate antigen in real life. Um, so essentially what they're gonna now do is circulate throughout your lymphatic system, uh, hoping at some point to encounter their cognate antigen. The good news for you is that of these millions of T cells and B cells in circulation, most of them will never encounter their cognate antigen. Most of us will never be exposed to Ebola, so any of those T cells or B cells that would be activated in response to Ebola, thankfully, will never get to be activated. So they'll just continue, continue circulating throughout the lymphatic system in vain looking for their cognate antigen. Like I said, T cells and B cells are mostly found in our secondary lymphoid organs, which is any one of the 500 different lymph nodes we have in our body. It could also include things like the spleen. So let's talk about what those cells actually look like. So T cells come in a couple different varieties. Uh, you have your helper T cells, which we abbreviate TH. You have your killer T cells, which are often abbreviated CTL for cytotoxic T lymphocyte. And you have your regulatory T cells, which is often abbreviated as Tregs. So helper T cells, you can think about as the quarterback of the immune system. Their job once activated is to circulate throughout the lymphatic system and go to the different tissues. Uh, they actually help to direct what happens. So for example, they can secrete cytokines that help to activate and hyperactivate macrophages, keeping them fighting. They help to keep the inflammatory response going so that more neutrophils and natural killer cells will make it into the tissue. They're also responsible for activating B cells. So without helper T cells present, uh, most B cells will never actually be activated to uh, get to the point where they can start producing antibodies. So think of the helper T cells as sort of the quarterback of the immune system. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, killer T cells, like I said, are often abbreviated CTL for cytotoxic T lymphocyte. Killer T cells are our specialized antiviral weapons. Uh, once they are activated, they will actually go to the tissue. They will interact with our own cells. Um, if you remember, I talked about the major histocompatibility complex, so the MHCs that are on the surface. Uh, just like natural killer cells, they're interested in MHCs. Unlike natural killer cells, um, they actually want to be able to see what information is contained within those MHCs. We'll talk about that a bit more when we talk about antigen presentation. Um, and because of their specialized approach, uh, they're very good at identifying which cells have been infected with a virus. And just like natural killer cells, we'll ask them to kill themselves through apoptosis to remove them from the body. Regulatory T cells are actually sort of like the gas, uh, sort of like the pedal, of uh, the brake pedal of the immune response. Uh, regulatory T cells come on towards the end of, a, of, of an immune reaction and help to slow things down. So you can think about it this way. If you're driving in a car, in this, immune, in this analogy, the uh, immune response is the car, and it's going 80 miles an hour. If you simply let your foot off the gas, it will eventually slow down to the point of almost stopping, right? Well, that's great, but in terms of your immune response, that could be several days longer than it needs to be. Your immune response is, um, is not only energetically uh, unfavorable, it uses a lot of energy, uh, it's also potentially harmful. You don't want your tissue being damaged more than it needs to be to fight off an infection. So what happens? The Tregs come in. Uh, they're like the brake pedal, and when they come in, they shut the immune system, the immune response completely off. Okay, so that's what regulatory T cells do. There's only two different, uh, and the big thing to remember is both all of these different types with the exception of regulatory T cells, so killer T cells and, and uh, helper T cells are actually able to form memory versions of themselves uh, as well. We'll talk about those a little bit more in just a minute. B cells, on the other hand, they're going to differentiate either into plasma B cells, uh, which are the B cells that will produce uh, antibodies. So once they get activated, they'll actually hang out uh, in the bone marrow or the spleen and just fire out thousands of antibodies per second uh, to help fend off infections. And there's also a memory version of B cells that help to remember uh, whatever infection they were activated by uh, for future reference. So as I mentioned before, the third line of defense, adaptive immunity, uh, really has two key components, specificity and memory. So the specificity of the adaptive immune system is conferred by those T cell and B cell receptors that are produced during 
the maturation process of any T-cell or B-cell. But what about that second key feature, memory? Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the fact that both T-cells and B-cells are able to form memory versions of themselves. They create specialized cells that remain in the body after an infection that can be reactivated very rapidly in response to another reemergence of that particular infection. How they do this is similar but different. So the majority of B cells that are activated in response to an infection are going to be your plasma B cells. So these plasma B cells are the B cells that produce antibodies that are used to, uh, that go throughout the body and help fight off an infection. But it turns out that there are actually two different versions of, of plasma B cells. The first is what's called a short-lived plasma B cell. These are the ones that are involved in the initial infection. So these are going to, uh, remain in, in the bone marrow, the secondary lymph organs, lymphoid organs, and secrete thousands of antibodies per second to help fight off the infection. There's also a second version, which is actually a memory version of this called a long-lived plasma B cell. Long-lived plasma B cells don't really participate in the initial infection. Instead, they go and they hang out in the bone marrow and then spend their entire lives basically secreting low levels of whatever antibody they were activated to produce that continue to circulate throughout the body uh, to help sort of negate any future infections. So these long-lived effector B cells are actually one of the first types of memory cells that are actually produced uh, by B cells. There's also another version that lives inside the secondary lymph organ, lymphoid organs, and this is called a central memory B cell. A central memory B cell uh, essentially goes through this process of very slow proliferation. In other words, every so often it divides. And to do this, it then it divides so that it can begin to replenish those long-lived effector B cells, uh, long-lived plasma B cells that are currently in the bone marrow. So over time, even those long-lived versions of those plasma B cells will die just simply due to old age. So what happens is these central memory B cells slowly replace those long-lived plasma B cells so that your body is continuously producing low levels of whatever antibody they were activated to produce. So that's B cell memory. So you can see how then by producing these low levels of antibodies, the other thing about those central memory B cells is that they can be activated very, very rapidly should their cognate antigen ever show up inside of that secondary lymphoid organ. They would then rapidly reproduce, proliferate, and make a bunch more short-term plasma B cells to rapidly mount an antibody response should that infection ever show up again. T cells are a little bit different. So the majority of T cells that are actually produced uh, in an initial infection are going to end up going to the tissue. Now, you can have helper T cells as well as killer T cells that are in the particular tissue. The big thing is this, about 90% of those cells will end up undergoing apoptosis and remove themselves from the body once the infection is over. Remember those Tregs show up and they're like, hey, hey, we're done here, right? We're gonna turn off the immune response. So about 10% of those that were initially activated in that infection will just linger around in those tissues, waiting for something else to show back up that they recognize, and then they can initiate a very rapid response to any invasion of that tissue by, by that particular pathogen. There will also be uh, central memory T cells that hang out in the secondary lymphoid organs. Again, just like we saw with the central memory B cells, should that particular pathogen show up again, should its cognate antigen show up in that secondary lymphoid organ, that central memory T cell can then reactivate and initiate a whole new round of T cell production that will be necessary for fighting off the infection. So in addition to those two, you've got your, you've got your resident uh, T memory T cells, you've got your central uh, memory T cells. There's also uh, that one that's called a, a an effector memory T cell. These are going to circulate throughout the bloodstream and the lymphatic system, helping to uh, also render some type of memory for should for should that particular pathogen uh, show up again inside of the body. So collectively, what you can see from these adaptive immune cells it are cells that are incredibly specific with what they do. They have a dedicated task, be it acting like a quarterback, like helper T cells, whether they're specifically tasked with fighting off viral infections in the case of killer T cells, or whether they're going to be antibody producing cells like, like plasma B cells. But the other thing about this branch of, of the immune system is that they're able to also form memory versions of themselves. These memory versions help your body to store the memory of all past infections. These are what are created once your body has been infected by something or in the case of vaccinations. So when you receive a vaccination, for example, a flu shot or, or an MMR vaccination or a DTaP vaccination, what ends up happening in many cases is your body builds up memory B cells and memory T cells. Even though your body's never actually experienced the true infection, they've experienced some version of the infection that tricks your body into thinking that they have been exposed to, for example, uh, tetanus, 
Therefore, your body is able to very rapidly mount a response should that actual pathogen show up in your body. Without the memory, without the memory conferred by your adaptive immune system, every day would be like the first day of your immune system's life. Without this ability of your body to form memory T cells and B cells, vaccinations would not work. Thank you so much for tuning in to our second video on the immune system where we talked about the different types of immune cells. We talked about innate immune cells and adaptive immune cells. We talked about where they come from. We talked about what roles they perform and how they perform those roles and why those roles are so important for our survival. We will continue our conversation with the immune system very shortly. Thank you again so much for tuning in. I look forward to talking to you soon. Bye.